Hello there, welcome to Venture Capital with me, Katie Pilbeam. This week, we're gonna be talking about bankers' salaries. Are they still too high? We've got an exclusive interview coming up on that one. Also, the world's highest paid female athletes, finding out who they are. Staying sporty with Kate Partridge, RT Sports presenter, coming in to talk to me about football and business. As well as that, we've got corporate news and checking in at the market's desk with our in-house trader here at RT. That's all to come, but let's get started with US debt. Because the official figure of $16 trillion seemed worryingly high, but according to a study by the University of California, America's debt is actually four times higher at $70 trillion. So how much does that sum equate to? Well, let's compare it to the world's most valuable company, Apple. So here we go then. Now, as you can see, this official figure equates to 40 Apple empires, but Professor Hamilton's studies found that the US has over $70 trillion of unaccounted for debt, which would make up a total of 165 apples. But it turns out that even $70 trillion may be an understatement. A former economic advisor for President Ronald Reagan, Professor Kotlikoff, says it could be as much as $211 trillion or 500 times the world's most valuable company. I asked author of Street Smarts, Jim Rogers, if he was surprised by the new findings and how much longer such extraordinary debt levels can be sustained. I'm absolutely not surprised. I've written in two or three of my books, most recent one, Street Smarts, about this debt situation. As the U.S. government has been lying to us, the debt is at least 50 trillion. And if you actually get out the people who've done thorough studies, it's over 100 trillion U.S. dollars. Katie, there is no way that America can ever pay its debt. Now, this is not going to affect the markets anytime soon, but eventually, when we start having problems in the financial markets, everybody's going to suddenly focus on it. They're going to know that America's bankrupt, They're going to, and it's going to cause even more turmoil in the financial markets, the credit markets, the, the, uh, the, the currency markets. It's going to affect all of us in a huge way. And moving on to bankers' salaries. The latest data from the European Banking Authority is likely to infuriate the average EU citizen struggling to make ends meet in these times of tough budget cuts. The figures reveal that the bankers at the very heart of the crisis, 3,000 of them, are taking home more than 1 million euros a year in pay and bonuses. But most of that cash is being dished out in London's financial centre, accounting for three quarters of the seven-figure salary in the EU. Now, Germany came in second with 170 bankers receiving 1 million euros or more, and France came in third with 162. So, as you can see, there's a huge difference between London and the rest of the EU. So, the question really is are these salaries justified? Well, I've got Patrick Young right here from DV Advisors to give me the lowdown on this. So, Patrick, I'll start right, th right there, if I may. Great to have you with us. Are they justified, these huge, fat salaries? What do you reckon? Well, on one way, yes, they're justified. Before everybody switches off in fury, let me make that rather clear as to why I'm saying so. The whole point about bankers' salaries are that they're generally paid in investment banks in relation to how much money they make. Therefore, if they make more money, they get a higher salary. That's probably not an unreasonable principle by which to govern these things. However, the problem actually lies behind the scenes of what's going on here. The reason at the moment, despite the economic travails for the rest of Europe, that these bankers can make so much money is because of the shambolic farce which has been government reaction to the crisis of 2007-2008. First of all, we had the whole situation where governments refused to let banks go bankrupt. That was ridiculous. All of a sudden, banks became part of the government firmament, effectively. Second of all, we had a situation where the central bankers, many of them former bankers themselves, such as the recent arrival Mr Carney as the head of the Bank of England. These people, the central bankers, have simply gone on for the last five years with a frankly insane policy of handing over money. They call it quantitative easing. They give away assets free, money free, to the banks, and they say, there, go and help yourselves. 
use this money in order to manage to rebuild your balance sheets. So the result is they don't lend it to ordinary people. They don't lend it to entrepreneurs. Instead, they take something they've been given for free, they make a lot of money out of it, and of course, because of the rationale of bankers' bonuses, because they're making a lot of money, they get large bonuses. Uh, what about the bonus cap then? Do you think that's going to work at all that's going to be introduced in London? Is that the answer? Oh, look. I mean, this is just an absolutely farcical example of regulators trying to do something to justify their political masters who've already managed to mess the whole thing up. No, they won't work. We don't have bonus caps on footballers, yet they get €100,000 a week for kicking an inflated pig's bladder around a lawn. Why not? Because it's capitalism. People should be allowed to earn what ultimately they can manage to make in profit. That's a very reasonable and sensible assertion by which they can all end up paying more taxation and ultimately then helping government. No, bonus caps simply will not work. All they will do is drive business out of the EU. They'll go to somewhere like Moscow, where they've got a very enlightened tax regime and a growing financial centre. Patrick Young from DV Advisors, thank you very much indeed for your time today. Very much appreciated. Russia's controversial economic amnesty law has been back in focus this week. The bill means that former oil tycoon Mikhail Kudukovsky and his business partner Platon Lebedev are serving a nine-year sentence for fraud and tax evasion charges and will now be released from prison two months early. Some of the economic crimes that qualify for amnesty include business fraud, money laundering and tax evasion. This new law has been embraced by the business community, seen as a step towards making Russia more investor-friendly. And now time for some corporate news. The owner of Russia's biggest aluminium producer, Rusol, Oreg Darapaska, is closing factories across Russia and may ask the government for another bailout. Cellular provider Megafon buys 4G operator Skartel for $1.2 billion. And this week, Russia's biggest carrier, Aeroflot, made the top five list of leading airlines in Europe by revenue. And now it's time to check in at our markets desk. We're going to find out what's been happening to the Russian markets, what's been moving and shaking this week. We've got our very own RT News presenter, Sean Thomas. I've been very generous, haven't we, Sean? We're giving you $10,000 US dollars to, go, right. uh, to go trading with, an amateur trader. But this is serious business. What have you been up Indeed. to? Tell us all about it. How, how's the experience going? Well, Katie, uh, there's good news and bad news. As you mentioned, I am an amateur. So I kind of went about this from a news approach or a common sense approach. And I figured, what do people need? What do they like need in this world? And metal, that's one thing that makes everything go round, from uh, aluminum cans uh, to parts for computers. So I kind of took a dive, because I went with Rusol, uh, the world's largest aluminum company. And you talked about Oleg Deripaska a little bit there before. And it tanked down 70%, so Ooh. not very good at all. But I'm holding faith, because the metals are rallying. In fact, Deripaska was out in Vladivostok this week and he talked about looking to the east uh, for the direction of the market. China, a big buyer of metals, their production is up. Uh, so I'm looking uh, to metals. I, I'm going to have some faith in Deripaska here. But there was also some good news because I uh, looked at the grid companies because oh, yeah. everybody needs power, right? Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, in fact, our television station wouldn't run without electricity. True. So I looked at the grid companies. They're up quite a bit or at least doing okay. So while I took a bath with metals, I did okay with some of the grid companies this week. Okay, good stuff. So a mixed bag going on. Uh, next week, you don't have the excuse of being a beginner in all of this. So we want to know, <laughs> what is up your sleeve? Uh, what have you got planned? What are you going to be tackling? Right, indeed. Okay, again, from a common sense approach, uh, I was looking at the banks and the central bank basically not changing lending rates. So I'm thinking the financials might be one way to look at that. And whenever they, uh, the financials are steady, that means oil is going to do well, at least in my mind. So I'm going to be looking at some oil. And then then also cell phones, right? You have one, I have one, we all have one. Uh, people you just live off of these things. And so on this news about megaphone purchasing Scartel, uh, I'm expecting that to do good things. So I'm going to go for some cell phone action uh, for the coming week. You do that. Sean Thomas, <laughs> thank you so much indeed for that. And uh, checking in next week, we want results. So the okay. pressure's on, all right? Okay, all right. Sean Thomas just there. Okay, moving on. 
Forbes has named Russia's tennis superstar Maria Sharapova the highest paid female athlete for the ninth year running thanks to her million dollar contracts with Nike, racket brand Head and her own brand of sweets. Ms Sharapova has made a staggering $29 million last year. Despite being the world's number one tennis player, Serena Williams of the USA came in second in the cash stakes with a core $20.5 million. And fellow tennis players made up third and fourth place with China's Li Na with an $18.2 million pay and Victoria Azarenka of Belarus with $15.7 million. The fifth place went to a female racing champion, Danica Patrick just said, gorgeous women, girl power, we like it. Now, moving on, staying with sports, the billionaire owner of Russia's most expensive football club, Angie, is planning to slash the budget by two thirds. Mr. Solomon Kirimov, Russia's 19th richest man with a fortune of $7 billion, is planning to sell some of the world's top players to achieve his goal. And as you can see, the stars, they do not come cheap. Now, this is a change of tact for Mr. Kirimov, who splashed out more than $180 million last season. Now, one of the reasons for his belt tightening could be down to the fact that his potash empire, Eurocali, recently took a battering on the stock market, dropping 20% after the collapse of the world's biggest cartel fell through. So, for more on what's behind these cuts and the, the implications on the sporty side of thing, I've got the fairy lady just here, Kate Partridge, our sports host. Uh, tell me, what do you make of these cuts then, Kate? Hello then, Katie. Well, first of all, gone are the days when Angie hit the headlines by signing big name players like Samueletto and Villian. That seems to be all over. And it's not just no longer big signings, it also means wage cuts. So all these big earners, they'll be going. Samueletto earns a reported 10 to 20 million dollars a year. And it's not just the big name foreigners that be going as well, it's also Russians. The Russian football system means there's a quota and you have to have four Russians on the pitch at any one time. This pushes up the prices of the Russians and their wages. So they've got to go too. So three internationals, they've already left Angie. So if you don't have established players, where do you get your team from? So the emphasis now is going to be on youth investment, youth development. Mm -hmm. As part of the Angie project, Mr. Karimov said, we're going to put money in local players, in local Dagestan players and encourage them. And they could also be returning to Dagestan because currently all Angie's players live and work and train in Moscow and fly to Makachkala some 800 miles away for their home matches. This looks like that could be at an end as everybody goes local. Well, just having, uh, I mean, I'm not an expert, as I say, but just looking at, at the league table and the stats, the goals and all of that, even with all these millions, they haven't done particularly well, have they? Well, that's only really so far this season. When the announcement came in, four games had gone so far, two defeats, two draws, two points from a possible 12, eight points adrift from the top already, fourth bottom. However, there's a tendency to look at Angie and Suleiman Karimov and compare him with Roman Abramovich and Chelsea. Well, you can't. When Abramovich bought Chelsea, it was an established club, established history, established mm -hmm. fan base, everything was established. Angie wasn't. And let's face it, last year they were title contenders for the first part of the season. They ended up coming third. They're in the Europa League for two years running. Pretty impressive for a small club. And now they have Gadji Gadjiev coming back, experienced coach, to steady the ship from Klia Sovetov. It's going to be an interesting season for us, but also for Angie. Kate Partridge, thank you very much indeed for your time. And that's it for this week's edition of Venture Capital. You can join me same place, same time next week. Have a great one. Goodbye.